The house sits in an estate of about 420 acres. There's a walled garden across the road and there's a lot, about 400 or so acres of woodland that has footpaths that the public can use as they walk through. Leith Hill Tower was built by Richard Hull in about 1750 and he wanted to have the highest viewing point in the south of England. The early tenants of the house are really unknown. The house changed hands an awful lot. In 1847, the Wedgwood family actually bought the house. So this is Josiah Wedgwood III, the grandson of the famous Potter. And he and his wife, who was Caroline Darwin, moved to the house and set up their family here. Rafe Vaughan Williams inherited the house uh, from his brother. It had passed through the Wedgwood family and their mother was a daughter of the Wedgwoods. He grew up in the house from the age of about two until about 20 because his father died quite young. But when Rafe inherited the house, he gave it straight to the National Trust. It's a very haunting place. It's on the top of the hillside there. It's quite... It's it's almost bleak in a way, but you know, the views are so beautiful. Uh, I very much like making work to do with a place, often historical, but not necessarily. I'm often trying to grasp something that's quite intangible. The house is really majestic. It's got a really nice feel about it, even though it has been neglected for a while. I felt drama. It's a dramatic space, but it's a bit lonely. I came to Leith Hill in the winter with Julie and Penny, and the place was very cold and very empty. And I thought that that was going to be actually quite an easy blank canvas for me to fill. But actually, I found it quite hard in the beginning. So I had to stay here. I had to visit this space a lot to try and understand what was going on. It was basically an empty shell. Part of it was requisitioned during the Second World War for Canadian troops. When the National Trust got the house back in 2008, after it had been long-term let as a boarding house for a local school, it was in quite a poor state. So the Trust have tried to sympathetically bring the house back to life. We bring in music for Vaughan Williams, and we have exhibitions of Wedgwood pottery. So we try and keep alive the spirit of the families who lived here. So this is the first time we've actually commissioned artists to create something new. The exciting thing about the echoing space is bringing together three different artists who work with different media and giving them an empty space to interpret in their own way. Possibly because of its history, because it's been so many things, and the artefacts of history that belong to it, you're not really constrained by them. I'm not particularly aware of any other houses where they've got that opportunity to try a whole different range of things, which is the purpose of the whole project, really. The place that excited me was the cellar. It's full of graffiti. Firstly, from the 60s with the Wedgwood family. They had a bit of a mad weekend, I think, with their friends painting on the cellar walls, Cretan-style paintings from Knossos. And later on, boys that were boarding at Leith Hill Place graffitied over the top of it. It is a strange place. It feels a little bit spooky and, and sort of wrong. It's all a bit strange. The National Trust want artists in to do residencies, to spend time within the building and really truly respond to it. So it's not just a matter of putting a picture up on the wall, that we actually are teasing out the essence of the building. Because it's all referring back to the history of the house, that in itself brings us all together. Recent years have been working in ceramics, but I don't really like to be tied down by that. And that's why I liked the, this challenge here, because I wanted to make a large piece of work, but in a way it's small components. There was a Wedgwood connection there, and to me the colours 
of his jasperware reflect the landscape and I kind of wanted to bring that together. Working in a historic environment always presents challenges. We really try and care for the fabric of the building. It's been here for over 600 years and we'd like to try and keep it for as long as that, if not longer. We've challenged the artists we've brought in by saying to them that they can't put things straight onto wooden floors and they can't put holes in the walls. It was only by being there and thinking, well, come on, I'm surrounded by woodland and there must be some way of bringing this in. And Tom, a great friend, we both came up with the same idea, actually, of this particular way of making a tower in Hazel. That wonderful ability to bring the outside into the house and it's a very flexible material I could put my small birds on. We're in a derelict coppice woodland belonging to Leith Hill Place. We're lucky enough to be able to cut some of this down and take it back into management. Coppice is a hazel species that you cut down and then it regrows back up from the stump to produce seven or eight whips or branches. It's a really great material. Penny wanted to have a tower that was going up through the centre and when she originally showed me an aluminium gantry, I thought, well, that really wasn't very keeping and it's lovely to be able to use a product that comes from the place where it's being exhibited, giving it a chance to shine and it's going to be a large tower of hazel held together with rings. I really like the stairwell in the house. I like the sort of darkness of it. I don't really want to make a tree. I wanted to make a construction that's quite fragile, rather than just placing a piece of work on a shelf or on a plinth or something. I like integration of these different materials, to be able to look up and see through them. Because Royal Williams lived at the house when he was a young boy, it was obviously a very important place for him. He would have spent much time in the woods and he wrote the famous Lark Ascending. So I, I started to associate that definitely with birds and that would be a good way in to use the Jasperware colours. And then I started looking at the Lark and how it is declining and all the other birds that are declining too, for various reasons. The birds were coming inside the house. The colours of the landscape were coming inside the house. That's what I initially really wanted to do. Finding out about the main characters was important. Vaughan Williams, obviously, Charles Darwin, um, and some of the Wedgwood family. I was trying to get into the spirit of how they felt. Vaughan Williams, obviously his love is music. He also loved getting everybody, everybody, to sing or make music in any way that he could. My first instinct was to make an intergenerational sound installation. Luckily I found Morrigan, the folk band, um, we got a couple of schools to come over to do some workshops so that I can make my recordings of them singing for my sound installation. We're in Leith Hill Place, which is the childhood home of Vaughan Williams, and this instrument is the piano that he purchased in the early 1900s and used in his home in Chelsea to work out his compositions. 
it's very appropriate that he should have a sort of ordinary working piano that might have been in an ordinary person's parlor and then at the same time he's going around collecting folk songs from you know the working people of the country i remember when i first encountered the songs of vaughan williams at a folk club i was astounded at this beautiful music i'd never heard before we saw a great opportunity to sing some of the folk songs that he'd collected and bring them back here and then involve other people in learning them. Being part of uh, bringing the house back to life uh, does feel important, it feels important to us. It's uh, something about filling it with singing. And all day long she will whistle and sing And at night she will return to her own nest I'm a printmaker essentially, but I do all sorts of things. I work in installation as well. So I wanted to join in with the graffiti, and of course we're not allowed to do that. What I'm doing is printing my drawings onto perspex, and then I'll light them up and cast the shadows of my work on top of the existing graffiti. It becomes a bit of a Grecian grotto. It felt strange and uninhabitable. And with the light and shadow, it just pulls you in. We were walking in the area, came across this place, had lunch here, and uh, they were asking for volunteers. 20 years I've been passing these old places and thinking, gosh, I wonder what that place is. My contribution to this residency is a piece called The House of Life. When I first came to Leith Hill in the winter, when it was uh, very empty and cold, I used to stand at the windows and look out. And then I'd start hearing the voices of the volunteers and then the building started to come to life. And I realised that's what I wanted to create an artwork about. I thought that what I'd do is that I would take their portraits and I would record them as well, put those two elements together. I'd been looking around in different rooms and looking at the photography in different rooms and there was a portrait of Darwin that was a wet plate silver collodion and I thought that that's what I would like to do. You can take a portrait, a digital one, but actually to use the wet plate method enables the volunteers to actually become much more involved in the artwork, have the whole process take place in the building. For me as an artist, that's really important because my work is a lot about the community. Wet plate silver collodion process dates back from 1870. I actually had my photographer, Emma, work with me on this project. The process takes about 10 minutes. So when they sit down in front of the camera, I ask them to sit comfortably because the exposure time is going to be between like 25 and 45 seconds. And I focus up on them, frame up the shot, and then I go into the dark room to pour my plate. I put the tin type with the collodion on into the silver nitrate bath. This sensitizes the collodion to light. Then I put the tintype ready to be exposed into my camera plate holder. I then go back into the studio, refocus, and then we shoot the photograph. And then I go back to the darkroom. We unload the back of the camera and I hand pour developer. 
as soon as the image starts to appear, then you can start washing it with deionized water. And then it goes into hypofix. That washes away any excess silver that wasn't exposed to daylight in the camera. I would say the greatest challenge is that there are so many variables. Temperature, humidity, chemistry, there's your technique. But still, it's about the end photograph. I have the feeling that I did when I first fell in love with photography. It's all magical. It's so exciting. Yeah, it's just suddenly seeing this image just appear yeah. out of nowhere. You're appearing. You're appearing. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. That was a very important part of the piece for me, enabling the volunteers to see their portrait emerge through this very old-fashioned technology. When I started the recordings with the volunteers, what I wanted to capture were the first time that they ever came to the building, the spaces that they love. I also wanted to find out a little bit more about themselves. I came up here when Wedgwoods had it, because I live literally at the bottom of the hill and they had a great big doll's house and we used to come up here as children, have a look at the doll's house and then walk up to meet the librarian family. in the school. So I've known this house for a long, long time. I've made a 78 record. It mirrors the photography. You've got the crackles and the hisses. They're not perfect, but they evoke a sense of history.
it's a really measured response to this beautiful building. Even tonight the sounds sort of echoing around are sort of, of life and they're bringing life back into the place which is lovely. And I think it's great that the National Trust are looking at doing things differently. It just captured the heart and soul of the house I think. It feels like a, a building buzzing with life now. I think the exciting thing is that you feel you could do something yourself. It suddenly seems like it's yours and this place is ours. Anybody can come here and suggest some activities, some spirit, some life, and I'm sure they'd embrace whatever you're interested in. And it's sort of exciting because it's open to all of us to do yeah. music, art, workshops, teaching, gardening. It's all here. Thank you. 